Hey there YouTube, I'm Ikitsu the Ikitsu Times, welcome to my channel, welcome to a little bit more Total War Warhammer. So, the wood elves are out, and this is an interesting thing for me, because I've got sort of mixed feelings about this. On one hand, I do like the fact that they finally got one of the elf uh, groups in there. Uh, the one problem is that I'm a high elf player, I don't really like or appreciate the wood elf style of play. And I'm actually really against that sort of very, very evasive skirmishy style of gameplay. Um, I would much rather if they had objectives on the battlefield if they're going to allow the style of play in, especially if they're going to encourage it. It's something that, you know, I play with, but I don't appreciate. I don't really like the fact that it's in these sorts of games. And, uh, you know, I, I played as, as well, for example, like the nomadic type groups in uh, Total War Rome and Attila. I didn't really like the fact that they're in there, but you want to learn how to play them, you want to learn how to play against them. Haven't really done that for this game yet because it's not really been necessary, but now it will be. So not really really my cup of tea. I prefer like the High Elves because they were the very disciplined type. Uh, they didn't rely on hit and run tactics. They were very, very much just uh, blocks of in infantry that would line up and, and just mow down the enemy sort of uh, very mechanically. Um, a bit like the Romans in, in many respects, or the Greeks. Uh, and, and I prefer that style of combat a little bit better. So, uh, while this is interesting to me, I don't necessarily think that these are going to be my favorite faction, uh, but I do like them a little bit more than I like most of the other factions. The only one that I really like sort of at, along with these guys are sort of the Bretonians in Empire, because they kind of fight in, in that sort of traditional style, and I'm very boring, I guess. So, uh, we got, uh, first of all, though, Glade Lord. You've got two different varieties of it. One is Malie, the first one over here. And uh, they've got the Elven Steeds here giant eagles or uh, forest dragon for their mounts. You'll notice that the only one that dramatically increases their durability is the forest dragon. So if you want to have a durable forest lord, uh, glade lord, you're going to definitely want to pay the points to get that dragon there. And I think that works well with the melee type one. Um, if you're going to go for, for example, the giant eagle or whatever, you still got 50 armor, which is what you've got on foot or with the horse. So you got a very, very fragile sort of general here, by contrast to what you would normally want. Now, their melee attack and melee defense are pretty high statistics, but that's not going to be really enough to keep this guy out of uh, trouble there. And his melee attack weapon strength is pretty low. Uh, they have got Call of the Woods, which is a plus 8 melee attack aura, which makes them quite decent at that sort of melee attack uh, support role. They've also got Foe Seeker, and they've got uh, Deadly Onslaught, which are very generic um, abilities for a melee lord. And they've got access to your typical range of potions, including Potion of Toughness, which could make him a little bit more up there in terms of durability. Now, the second type of Glade Lord is a little bit more interesting. They've got the same mount options, but they've got different abilities. The Eye of Kernos is a plus 12% missile damage uh, aura, which I think fits the Wood Elves a little bit better. They've got the Arrow of Kernos, which causes armor-piercing damage. Um, it's just a magic missile that you fire off once every minute and a half or so. Pretty good range, uh, pretty decent ability all in all. And then they've got the Prey of Aneth Ray, Ray, Ray Ma, or something like that. Uh, minus 22% missile resistance for an opponent, and they cannot move. So if your opponent is foolish enough to sort of try to chase down one of your units with, say, like a Flying Lord on a Dragon or something like that, you can pin him in place in front of all of your missile units and just open fire on him, and he'll probably take a lot of damage because he's going to be stuck there for like 12 seconds. Um, so I think that that's a pretty good, uh, good ability there. Now, I might actually be misinterpreting some of these effects because I have not actually been playing very much of these guys yet and have not had a chance to test out every single ability. But uh, in general, I do think that this is the better option if you're going for your typical Wood elf -y type style. And of course, the Glade Lord first one would be better if you're going to try for some sort of melee thing, but I would keep him in a supporting role. I would keep him relatively cheap. I might even opt to remove um, the other abilities here to keep him even cheaper. 881 point uh, Glade Lord is really, really cheap, and just have him use that Call of the Woods aura from behind. I think that that could be very, very effective in certain cases. Next up is Orion. Uh, he is a hybrid weapon specialist. Um, not 100% sure what that means when they say, like, hybrid. I don't think he counts as an infantry. I think he counts as monstrous, so I do think that bonus versus large applies to him, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, he has got Frenzy, and he's also Unbreakable, so you will never actually not be Frenzied. Uh, so that's basically just tack on 12% weapon damage, 8 melee attack, 8 charge bonus, and immune psychology to this guy all the time, because you will never lose those. Uh, he's got Foe Seeker, uh, if you need to get into combat a little bit faster, but he's already got a very high 56 uh, movement speed. So this actually works out really, really well for him if he needs to close with something fast. Uh, Hawk's Talon here is a strange bombardment ability that he can use. It's a little bit like um, Colect the Sun Eater, 
and his ability to call down lightning, this guy's able to sort of target an area around him that uh, causes a bit of damage to some units that are clumped up or whatever. Then you've got the Hounds of Orion here, it's just a vortex, so similar sort of thing, you just cast it whenever it comes up cooldown. Um, vortexes, unfortunately, and bombardments in this game are a little bit weak right now. Uh, they haven't really fixed that too much. Um, Cloak of Visha, plus 44% damage resistance when his hit points are less than 20%, so it's it's disabled when hit points are greater than 20%. So if you go to really low health, uh, this stops him from taking very much damage for a decent chunk of period. And this is actually really well synergized with his unbreakable nature, so if you're at, like, say, 10% health, normally that would be extremely dangerous because you might run before that ability can activate, but in his case, he's going to stick it out Klokovish is going to proc, and he's going to be able to stick it out for the last 10% uh, of his health. And since there are heal spells in the um, Wood Elf army, you could then start piling on heals on him. So you'd want to wait until he's at extremely low health before you wanted to heal this guy. The other ability is the Horn of the Wild Hunt, plus 24% speed, plus 36% charge bonus. Um, if you really needed to catch somebody, you could stack that with Foe Seeker. Um, and of course, this is an army-wide boost as well. Last 29 seconds, so this could really, really help if you're trying to close... Um, especially like combining it with high charge units, this could be a very very effective synergistic combo and he is sort of like the Lord of the Wild Hunt, um, basically I think he takes after Oberon or something like that. Um, so this would be a sort of um, melee rush type army composition, whereas I think the Glade Lord would be a little bit more conservative, it'd be a lot cheaper as well for that same sort of role. Uh, this guy would be sort of the, you want to get into your opponent's face as fast as possible, just pour out of the woods and uh, sort of surround them and, and charge them all down. I think that he'd be very, very good at that. Um, his weapon strength as well, armor piercing, extremely high. He'd be very good in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Um, armor piercing on his ranged attack is also quite high, but his missile damage is inherently low, so it's not necessarily the best one. His spear's supposed to teleport back to his hand, so it's a bit weird that he doesn't have unlimited ammunition, but I guess that's just for game balance reasons. For a thrown spear, that's also a very, very long range. Ancient Tree Man. Now, this is a little bit disappointing in some respects. Uh, he's actually weaker in melee combat than a regular tree man. And in fact, a regular tree man's even got more uh, morale. Now, there are lots of tree-type units in this army. Uh, one of the generic things you're going to see is that these guys take a lot more damage from flaming attacks. So there is that sort of weakness here. But he does have physical resistance plus 20%. All tree spirits do. Um, so that's an interesting thing there. Uh, he's got sort of lots of lots and lots of abilities here, including charge defense versus large for some reason. Um, he's got encourage, he's got blessing of the ancients, which is improved recharge rate. Uh, we're going to go over these abilities actually here. Um, so you've got the improved power recharge rate because he is a spellcaster. He's also got the life bloom, which is the uh, lore of life uh, special ability. Every time he casts a spell um, for 10 seconds, units uh, recover their hit points. So it's a fairly, it's a lot like Lore of Undeath, Lore of Life. It's Necromancy is basically the same as Lore of Life in this game, which is very peculiar. He's got Foe Seeker and he's got Deadly Onslaught, which makes him able to sort of pretend he's a melee general. Um, his melee attack and melee defense statistics are not great, but he is very, very tanky with 100 armor and very, very high hit point pool, as well as a decent uh, weapon strength there. It's very odd that he does not have high armor piercing damage. I believe the regular tree man does. Actually, no, the regular treatment does not. That's peculiar. So, like, this guy, I, th I would argue, is probably more like a very durable spellcaster that can fend for himself if attacked in melee. He does use exclusively the lore of life, which is a decent lore of magic. Um, I'll go over the specifics of lore of life and lore of shadow in a different video, but uh, that's sort of how these guys go. Um, next up is Durthew, who is a very angry... Um, I can't remember if this is a tree man as well, or if this is a dryad. I'm... Is this, um... I'm going to double check the lore on this character because I can't remember my Wood Elf lore all that well necessarily. Um, I think that this was a tree man. Yeah, that is a tree man. Okay, so um, there's also a Dryad version of this that I thought that could have been, but no, that's not. Uh, Drycho is the name of the dry, uh, Dryad one. Okay, so uh, anyway, Durthew, he's got a mix of sort of different lores here. Um, he's got lore of beasts here, actually. Um, but he's got sort of a weird set of abilities, because he's got the Blessing of the Ancients there. Uh, he's got Frenzy, which is a little bit worse on him than it is on Orion, because he's not unbreakable, so he will lose this. Um, he's got Foe Seeker, and then he's got this Magic Missile, Lamentations of Despair. Pretty decent uh, ability there. Now, his statistics are pretty similar to a regular Tree Man Lord. A little bit better in sort of most respects there. And he is armor-piercing, so he does have that sort of going for him. Um, 
I would say that this guy, like, still... If you want a really good melee brute, I still think that Orion is probably a little bit better. Um, you, I would say you take this guy if you want access to the Lore of the Beasts on someone that's not going to die while they're using it. They've also got, of course, the uh, Sword of Death, which is a little bit of a weird ability there. It lasts for 15 seconds, causes damage to combatants, strong versus multiple combatants, and a chance opponent will... Uh, you basically cast it on a single unit sort of thing. Um, and... Uh, or... or hope that it's going to deal lots of damage to a whole bunch of people around you. It's not really a great item. I don't like these sort of abilities. Um, so I tend to not really like these all that much. Uh, does have a very long cooldown as well. So, I mean, you could also use this guy for a decent melee brute as well, but it's not as good uh, statistically, I would say, as Orion. Now, if you need armor for whatever reason, uh, this could be a much better option, but you can see like the difference in statistics over here. Melee defense is much higher, hit points are higher, armor is higher, but uh, weapon strength lower by quite a bit, charge bonus quite a bit lower, and his abilities are definitely not suited for melee combat. Um, so I would definitely take this guy more for the spell casting. Next up are the heroes. The Waystalker is the first hero. Uh, this is a peculiar one because this is their generic one, but it acts a lot more like a uh, an engineer or a witch hunter or whatever. Um, they've got a strong missile attack there at 389 damage. In addition, they've got Hawkish Precision, which gives them a good chunk of extra armor-piercing damage. Decent number of shots they're capable of firing in any direction. They're capable of firing while remaining hidden, and they've got stock. So that sort of combination means that these guys are always going to be hidden unless an enemy sort of is right on top of them. And with their ability to fire in any direction while moving at a speed of 42, it's going to be very, very hard to actually see these guys if they don't want to be seen. So these guys, uh, not necessarily the best melee combatants, very, very fragile. But their missile attack can be used constantly to pretty good effect there. Uh, their other ability is the Arrow of Kernos, which we've seen before. You can just have it as a sort of bounce spell, cast it, chuck it at an enemy formation if you can get it around the side or something like that. Or you could potentially use this to snipe at characters. And this is an option that these guys can use once they're out of ammunition as well. Um, next up is the Branch Wraith. Uh, Branch Wraiths are more casters than anything else. You can notice that their statistics are not necessarily great. They are better than most casters in terms of melee combat. So they're a little bit more durable and can fight in melee combat a little bit okay. But I would still argue that these guys you want to use mostly as um, a caster. They've got the improved uh, cast rate. They've got the Lore of Shadows passive, which is plus 6% uh, movement speed. Um, whole map, while this one's actually constant, um, it's an interesting sort of one there. I think that the Lore of Shadows um, one is quite a strong passive there. They've got Call of the Woods there. This is also constant, uh, it's the same as the melee general, plus 8 melee combat um, attack. And that's a very good support ability. They've got Foe Seeker, which is not necessarily too important for these guys, but you could potentially use it to get away with one of these casters, which could be interesting. For lore, they've got a good mix of lore of shadow and lore of life. So if you don't want to take both types of casters, these guys are actually quite solid, because they've got some of the better spells from each of these lores. I think that, for example, Shield of Thorns is one of the best ones out there. Um, Earthblood is extremely powerful, and uh, Awakening of the Wood can be pretty okay. Um, I don't like Melkoth's Mystifying Miasma that much. Um, it's okay for dealing that slow. Um, the pendu Penumbral Pendulum is only really something I would take if I really, really knew my opponent wasn't going to move for whatever reason, but it would be hard to line this up. It's a line like... To, it's, it's basically fires off in the line. It's a little bit like... Um, that uh, undead spell that's extremely powerful, but shorter range. Um, so it would be hard to use this effect effectively, I think. Um, and then there's Withering. Withering's okay. I like the minus 8 leadership. I like minus 15 armor. Those are fairly good uh, hex numbers to be putting on someone. 31 second duration is pretty good. Um, but I'm not necessarily 100% sure that that's going to be that easy to use. Um, you can up this one, of course, to add an area effect, which would make it much, much more worthwhile. So that's when you would... This, this is one of the ones that you would probably want to use um, with the overcast option there. So, like, they've got some of the better spells from each of these. They don't have necessarily the best spells from each of these lores, but definitely some of the most utility from both of them. Um, next up, you've got the Lore of Beast one. This is a typical Lore of Beast one. They've got different mount options, though. They've got the Elven Steed. The Unicorn, which makes them a lot tougher, but a little bit slower. I would actually argue that most of the time you're just going to want the Elven Steed, um, especially because the Unicorns like adds melee statistics that you're probably never going to use. The other option, of course, is the Giant Eagle. Um, 
which just makes it so that you fly. I mean, if you're going to be in the air, then this is how you do it, but uh, spellcasters usually don't have to be in the air unless they're trying to line something up that's a little bit tricky. Their abilities here, typical sort of stuff there. They've also got, uh, of course, the Blessing of the Ancients there. Um, Arcane Conduit combined with that, uh, they could get some really, really fast um, spell points back. And then they've just sort of got the typical Lore Beast spells there. Lore of Shadow over here, same sort of thing. They're passive, again, uh, plus 6% movement speed. Then, of course, you've got the Lore of Life. Um, oops. Lore of Life here. Uh, they've got sort of their passive, which is um, replenishes health of combatants across the map uh, for 10 seconds. So, yeah, all, all of these guys are pretty useful. Um, I think I probably am going to be taking quite a lot of um, Branch Wraith just for casting because I like the combination of abilities that they have, but I could definitely see myself using all of these uh, quite often. So next up we got their infantry. Eternal Guard are their first basic infantry unit, and you'll notice that they have no real trash unit. Um, Eternal Guard are basically like the halberd unit for other factions there. They've got decent statistics all around, but a fairly small unit size. Um, very good armor piercing damage with a relatively low overall weapon damage with a decent bonus versus large. These guys are a fairly solid unit, I would say. Uh, they're possibly priced a little bit expensive for what they do. I wouldn't use these guys for holding a line though against regular infantry. I think that uh, they would be very, very poor against regular sort of generic infantry that you would uh, face against most factions. Next up are the Dryads. Um, these guys, I don't particularly like the statistical array for these guys. I'm hoping that they've got something else going on behind the scenes that makes them a little bit better at melee combat. Fairly small unit again, fairly fragile. Uh, low armor, which is a little bit disappointing because these guys are supposed to be kind of tough. Um, their speed is decent at 38. Their melee attack is kind of okay. Their melee defense is pretty bad. Uh, weapon strength is high, but it's got very, very low armor piercing damage. And their charge bonus is actually fairly mediocre for what you would expect out of these guys. All in all, like, they're kind of not really that amazing a unit. Um, it's hard to say exactly just what they're they're there for. Um, they have got sort of that weakness versus fire as well. It's going to be hard to say. It's, it's hard to say how meaningful that's going to be ultimately, but I think that that might be something that ends up um, just being a bigger deal than people think, just because I think people are going to be like, oh, what else? I might as well take uh, flaming attacks wherever I can. But who's, who knows, there aren't too many in the game right now. Next up are the Eternal Guard with shields. These guys are just a flat out improvement over the regular Eternal Guard. Um, plus seven to melee defense actually gives them a very high melee defense value, as well as not harming any of their other statistics, like their melee attack doesn't drop at all. Their armor um, gets the silver shield bonus, which is a very, very good missile block chance. So these guys become quite solid. Um, hard to say for sure, though, if these guys will be able to hold the line against other infantry. I'm expecting that it would not be cost-effective to use these guys to hold lines against uh, regular infantry. Um, I do think that they are a good value, though. Only 50 points more for 7 melee defense. Even if you're up against something that's not going to necessarily take a lot of missile units, that's a pretty good bonus. Next up are the War Dancers. War Dancers, very, very low armor, small unit size, but decent hit points for a 60-man unit. Um, They've got good leadership, very, very good speed, uh, very high melee attack, decent melee defense, honestly. Their weapon strength is quite good, but not very high armor piercing and very high charge bonus. So this is what you would use if you want to just sort of run out of goddamn nowhere and start really pounding on somebody. Um, they've got the 20% resistance to physical as well, and they've got the ability to reduce their melee attack to get more melee defense if they have to for whatever reason. Um, could be good in some circumstances, but I think that honestly you would want these guys to be using that melee attack bonus. This is the unit that I would use in conjunction with the Glade Lord, if I was going to go sort of a an ambusher melee route. Um, they've also got a variant with the spears here. It's a little bit less damage, a lot less melee attack, a lot more melee defense. Um, but they've got sort of a bonus versus large and anti-armor, so you could definitely weave these guys in. The problem with both of them is that they've got a very, very high price tag, which makes them ineffective against sort of cheaper units if they're faced off against a lot of them. Um, normally the War Dancers were supposed to be extremely good at chewing through many, many, many units of weaker infantry because they had like so many more attacks than whatever they were attacking that they would often like wipe out the entire unit before they could even be attacked back. That doesn't really happen in this game though, so it's going to be hard to say how they, see how these guys really function uh, as the meta, meta develops. Wildwood Rangers are the last variety there, and they're a little bit like the uh, War Dancers with the Azurai Spears. 
a uh, little bit slower, a little bit more armor. Uh, they do not have 20% physical resistance, but they got the same weapon type, much less melee defense, a little bit less melee attack. Um, I honestly think that actually I prefer the Azurai Spear. One of the reasons I like these guys is that if you can get a couple speed bonuses stacked onto this 48% and maybe bog down an enemy with, say, um, one of the Lore of Shadow spells here. Let's go into the Lore of Shadows here and say that I cast... where the hell is it? This one. Melkos Mystifying Miasma. If I just cast that on a unit um, of cavalry or whatever, like, say, Demigriff Knights, uh, these guys are going to be able to keep up with them and they're going to tear that unit to absolute pulp. Uh, very very effectively with their high uh, bonus versus large plus 23 versus large like these guys are almost as good as slayers and they're much much better at keeping up with cavalry and stuff like that than a slayer would be so these guys would be extremely powerful for that purpose um, they've also got that physical resistance there charge def uh, defense versus large immune to psychology like these guys are almost perfect uh, monster killers in many respects there very effective uh, unit for that but also fairly expensive 950 is very very expensive for that purpose Next up you got the Missile Infantry. Um, these guys have got the ability to move while firing, and they can fire in any direction as far as I've been able to tell so far. Um, these guys can therefore be used to skirmish in a way that's kind of annoying, I would say. I don't particularly like that uh, style of gameplay. Um, they functionally could have a speed of like 36, I think, with the auras, um, increasing their movement speed. Um, they're sort of compensate for this by the fact that they do get out skirmished by other skirmishers so if they're fighting against a unit of empire crossbowmen the crossbowmen will actually win um these guys have less armor um i believe they have even less hit points yeah the crossbowmen have more hit points um they've got less missile damage actually and they've also got the same range so their melee statistics and stuff like that all a little bit higher but that doesn't really matter too much for a ranged unit so you can out skirmish these guys quite easily. They also cost 25 points more than a unit of uh, crossbowmen. So these guys are a little bit peculiar in that sort of sense there, that they're not necessarily very good skirmishers against other skirmishers, but they're extremely powerful against melee combatants, melee infantry, because they can just sort of be set to run away. And I don't like that style of gameplay being in the game particularly. It's not really something I think is conducive to very, very fun gameplay. But I think that that's just going to be something that you have to learn to deal with when you're up against Wood Elves. They've also got the um, Starfire Shaft uh, variant. Now, this unit actually is more like a unit of handgunners in many respects. They've got flaming attacks that are armor-piercing, and they don't cost really much more, or uh, their cost is pretty similar in many respects to the uh, handgunners. They're, they're 50 points more. That's not that much more considering. Uh, they've got the 160 range. Um, they've got the higher missile damage. I think that this is actually a really good variant for these guys. Um, very, very strong at taking out monsters and stuff like that. And like regenerators are going to have a nightmare against these guys. I think that they're. I think it's a pretty good step up. The other variety are the uh, Hagban tips. These guys are just using poison arrows. These could also be very good. You could use those to slow down the enemy as they're trying to approach, disrupt them a little bit there, cause some problems. Um, I don't know that I like them as much as the uh, Starfire Shafts, but I definitely can see the Hagman tips being very, very useful for skirmishing if I'm running away. Um, I can definitely see the Starfire Shafts being, or yeah, the Hagman tips for if you're running away. The Starfire Shafts I can see as being extremely good if your opponent's just trying to run like a general who's a flyer into your lines there to try and take out those guys. You would hit them up with, say, um, whatever the hell this ability is called, the Prey of Anath Rame, Rame, whatever. So you would just like stop him right in front of a bunch of these guys and their armor piercing shots would just shred through that guy like butter. Um, I think that that sort of combination would work extremely well. Next up you've got the Deepwood Scouts. These guys are a little bit better at uh, sort of uh, dealing damage while hidden because they've got stock. They can sort of move around a little bit more freely. Uh, they've got shorter range however. Missile damage is quite a bit higher uh, by a decent chunk there. Um, unfortunately, they have a smaller unit size, so despite having the higher missile damage, the damage per volley is going to be pretty similar. Um, arguably, I would even say that the Glade Guard are probably just better because they've got the better range. Um, so, not really 100% sure that I really like the uh, Deepwood Scouts there. Their price is just not quite right there. They've also got the variety with the Swift Shiver Shards. Um, now, these things deal a lot more damage, but they fire two projectiles at once. I'm not sure how it's going to work for their ammo count. I'm hoping that that means they can fire 18 times, um, as opposed to they can fire 9 times. But uh, they've got significantly more missile damage, but at the cost of more range. 
So th these guys are extremely short range. They would have to be used fairly, very, very, very carefully to properly uh, deal their damage. But if they could deal their damage, like they could get around behind an opponent maybe with their vanguard and their stock, uh, maybe they could unload a bunch of arrows into the back of an enemy and deal tons of damage that way. Lastly, they've got the Way Watchers. The Way Watchers are extremely expensive, very, very small unit size. They've got 23 shots with um, armor piercing, or 23 missile damage with armor piercing. In addition, they've got the Hawkish Precision, so they deal actually even more armor piercing damage, but I'm not sure that's really enough to make it so that they're better than the Glade Yard with Starfire Shafts, which just feel like a better deal. Like 1,200 for a skirmishing unit that does not have like 220 range or something like that. It's just not really that useful to me. Uh, there might be a good argument to use these, we'll have to find out, but the combination of firewall moving, vanguard deployment, and stock though again, uh, combined with uh, hawkish precision, could be used very very effectively under certain circumstances, but I think that they would just get run down by like a unit of wolves or something like that. Very very expensive, very fragile, I don't particularly like them. Next up you've got the cavalry and uh, they've only really got two, wild riders and the wild riders with shields. Wild Riders with Shields are just a flat-out upgrade, they've just got plus 6 melee defense as well as silver block chance. Um, both of these operate like light cavalry but are very very expensive. They've got high offensive capability as a sort of result of this though. Um, both of them have Frenzy, both of them have that sort of physical resistance 20%, making them quite decent at dealing out damage. The problem is that they're so weak at absorbing damage in return that it's hard to really justify these guys. Uh, like, I think that they would not necessarily even do too well in a fight versus Knights of the Realm or something like that, just because they're so much um, more fragile. Like, their armor is bad, they're not armor-piercing or anything like that. Um, the Frenzy is pretty nice, though. Uh, like, th these guys are just a little bit overcosted, I think, for what they can do. But uh, I, I think that that's sort of supposed to be the downside to using these guys is that their melee shot cavalry is a little bit more expensive and a little bit harder to use. If they can be used effectively against like a rear charge versus infantry, they would be absolutely devastating as a result. The only problem is that if they get counter cavalried at all, I think they're going to do a little bit poorly, or if they run into like the front of spears, they're going to die a little bit too quickly for them to do too much. All in all, pretty decent units for their role, but they're so niche in their role that it's going to be hard to use them effectively. They're also too expensive, in my opinion, to be used taken just to run down um, like war machines or archers. I, I think that you typically want lighter, faster, uh, more expendable cavalry for that role, just because you'll typically lose them as uh, your opponent sort of goes to protect their uh, range units. So it's going to be hard to say how well these guys work for either of those sorts of roles. Next up you've got the Glade Rider. Uh, Glade Rider is your typical um, Archer Cavalry. Shorter range, decent damage, decent amount of ammunition, but lower number of shots there. Um, all in all, exactly what you expect for these guys. Pretty okay price tag of 750, but again, uh, this game's not really focused around Archer Cavalry. Um, they just don't deal damage fast enough to really make a huge difference in the way that combat works. Next up you got the Glade Riders with Hagbane Tips. These guys are a little bit more interesting because those poison arrows mean that you will never get caught out, and you can sort of keep these guys in reserve so that you can sort of swoop around the back of an enemy and start firing like Hagbane Tips poison units from behind and deal lots of damage sort of that way. I think that that's um, a bit expensive though, 825 for what's ultimately just uh, the same as these guys ultimately. Hawk Riders are next. Um, these guys, again, a little bit overpriced, I think, or something. I, there's something wrong with these guys. Like The problem is they've got 22 ammunition, modest um, missile damage, which is not armor piercing. Um, they've got decent range. Uh, the problem I have with these guys is that like, these guys do very, very little um, missile damage because there's only 18 of them. Um, I would say that the Glade Riders are so much better at dealing missile damage that these guys are kind of only there because they're hard to retaliate against. But I would say that even like the Gyrocopter, like the regular, regular Gyrocopter, is a better um, flying range unit than these guys. The one good thing about them is that they come in this unit of 18 that's got a decent amount of um, weapon damage. And it's armor piercing weapon damage at 45, so you can potentially rear charge a little bit more effectively with these guys than you could with those. But their melee attack, melee defense statistics, and their armor statistic are all so bad that charging into the back of those guys would just probably result in all of your hawk riders uh, getting killed as well. I don't even know that these guys would do all that well killing archers because archers don't really care that you've got um, armor-piercing attacks unless they're the dwarven ones, and dwarven ones will probably kick these guys' ass just because their melee defense and melee statistics are pretty okay. Your melee attack and melee defense statistics are absolutely trash with this unit. 
Um, the last one are the Sisters of the Thorn. These guys are going to be extremely powerful, but extremely hard to use. They've got um, a very short range uh, missile attack there. Very, very high missile damage with poison. Um, decent armor piercing on that. Not great, but decent. They've also got two bound spells here. The Curse of Einra here. Uh, minus 24% uh, speed and minus 6% accuracy. This can be extremely powerful. They've also got the Shield of Thorns spell that they can cast as a bound spell every 90 seconds. Very powerful ability. I think it's one of the better ones out there. But um, they're good at so many different things. They're modestly good at so many different things. And they're so expensive and fragile that you're going to have to pay an awful lot of attention to use these guys effectively. I think that's going to be quite difficult with these guys. Um, I think that they're a good unit, though. If you've got the sort of uh, attention span and APM to use these guys effectively, they're a combination of high damage, decent melee attack. Like, you could rear charge with these guys quite effectively um, and be okay with that. But all of that sort of combined makes these guys a little bit difficult to use, I would argue. Lastly, you've got the uh, monsters here. You've got the Great Eagle. Um, it's weird that they're listed as a forest spirit. I don't think they're supposed to be one. But they've got uh, low armor, decent hit points. They're fairly cheap for a monster, but you only get one of them. Uh, their leadership's okay, their speed's really quite good. Melee attack and melee defense are pretty decent, and their weapon strength's kind of low. Um, like, they're kind of a weird monster. Like, I, I would have actually expected you to get a squad of Great Eagles at uh, lower statistics. But they're a cheap flyer. I mean, if you want to disrupt a missile unit, these guys could probably do it and pull it off pretty successfully. Uh, hunt down war machines. These guys, I would actually argue, are better for that role than the Wild Riders. Next up, you got the Treekin. These guys are basically gigantic dryads. Their melee attack is quite low, um, but their melee defense, their armor, uh, their hit points are all very high, and they've got 20% physical resistance. So you can throw these guys into the middle of a fight and expect them to do extremely well. Uh, they are not armor piercing, which is a little bit disappointing, but they have got high weapon strength, high charge value. So these guys would be able to throw around the lighter infantry like they were not even there. I think that they would be quite effective at that. They have got charge defense against large foes for some reason, which is not too important for these guys since they would want to use their charge bonus against those large units, um, just in my, my uh, assessment of them. They're immune to psychology, but that doesn't matter really too much. Um, next up, you've got the Tree Man. The Tree Man is an interesting unit. It's a lot like the Giant. Um, in some fights, they will be tougher than a Giant because of their physical resistance plus 20%. Their melee defense is extremely high, their armor is extremely high, they've got a huge hit point pool. These guys are going to be very difficult to remove from the field. They've almost got as much leadership as a giant as well. Um, their weapon is not armor piercing again though, which is a little bit uh, disappointing. Does enough damage that you will get the job done against most armored opponents though. And their melee attack is magic and does good damage all in all. So you could also use these guys to clear out like hex wraiths or something like that pretty effectively. Um, I think that the, these guys are going to be something that you're going to see quite often. Charge defense against large foes again. It's a little bit odd yet again. Very powerful unit. I think that they're better than the giant, which is hard to really match. Like, this guy, even in many respects, would just walk through archers for the most part because their high armor value and their high physical resistance means that if you're firing at them with archers, you're not going to be doing that much damage to this guy. You have to use handgunners. So I think that this guy's going to be good against a large variety of different unit types and uh, army types. Next up you've got the Forest Dragon, and this is actually a very, very good single monster. Uh, it's got physical resistance 20% and missile resistance 25%. Decent armor, very high hit points, magical attacks, poison attacks, very good weapon strength, decent melee defense. Uh, the only problem with this unit is that it's fairly expensive, um, but the fact that you can just take these and uh, not have it take up your hero slots or anything like that means that you could actually probably take a very effective uh, Wood Elf uh, Flyer army. The only problem is that they've got fairly low hit points um, and like they're expensive. Like I, I don't know how easy it's going to be to sort of use these effectively. Typically I like using some, some, something like a Forest Dragon as a flanker, but you don't have a real main line necessarily. Um, I think that this is going to be a very, very interesting choice and a very strong addition to their, their force. It's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. So anyway, I'm going to try and get into a battle. We'll uh, get back to you once I do. Okay, and here we are. We're playing against dwarves in this particular battle. We've got a small number of our uh, Eternal Guard here, and we've got tons and tons of Glade Guard. So we're going to hopefully be able to sort of uh, march up to those dwarves and fire a lot of shots at them. We've got some aerial units as well, including our uh, Glade Lord, which we're going to be using hopefully quite effectively. 
and we've got ourselves Branch Wraith. So all, all of that hopefully will work out pretty well in our favor. So our hope here is to deal uh, damage to the dwarves with these uh, very powerful um, Starfire Shaft's arrows, which uh, are gaining a little bit of a bonus by being near to this uh, Glade Lord. Now we could have gone for another option, um, but I think that this is going to work quite well for us. Let's turn on skirmish mode there for a lot of these guys. All right, so we'll hit start battle here. Move our Eternal Guard up this flank, I think, and uh, just sort of get in range to start firing those Starfire arrows at the opponent there. Um, hopefully we'll be able to do some pretty good damage with those. My opponent does have a pretty good hill that he could be camped up on. We'll see what he's got for artillery, which could be unpleasant for us, but... He'll be able to recover back some of the deaths that we take from artillery if he's got it, um, just from the fact that we've got some lore of life spells here, uh, in particular the Earth Blood spell. Once we get close enough, I think that uh, the Mystifying Miasma should be a pretty good debuff there. Um, we'll hopefully get some good use out of that. And of course we can also go ahead and just uh, run in and use Arrow Kernelus against them. Alright. Yeah, so we kind of expected our Dwarven uh, adversary to be sort of back here. Got a couple cannons it looks like, and a Goblobber. But he has got lots and lots of sort of Dwarf Warriors and he's sort of boxed up and everything like that. He doesn't have a ton of missile units though. He's got like, his, uh, he's got obviously the artillery. But besides that, he's only got a small amount of um, actual missile units here. So if we keep our units fairly spread out, we shouldn't take too much damage here. And we might be able to take out some of their artillery. Alright, let's go ahead and get you into a good position here. Fire off that. Get you guys. Yeah, you guys can fire at them. That's fine. Of Aim, fire at these guys as well. Looks like we've taken out one of their cannons, which is pretty nice. Or what are? All right, fire at these guys. So you can see how much damage these flaming arrows are dealing to these units here. It's quite high, actually. Let's go ahead and use our Mystifying Miasma against these guys. We're also firing, as you can see, from our General, which is uh, dealing a little bit of damage. Even though it's just like a single arrow, it's uh, pretty effective. Let's move back with these guys here. Broken one of his units, but one of our archers has broken as well. Okay, so these units need to start running away, I guess. Oops, my uh, dragon's getting hit there. I want to charge into the back of these uh, dwarf warriors here. Charge in with this guy as well while we're at it. Reduce these guys' speed. Looks like that uh, got rid of one of the dwarf units there. Alright. The one problem I'm going to have, I think we're going to run out of ammunition in this fight. Pretty damn sure. Let's fire another shot at this cannon, I think. Charge into these dwarf warriors from behind again. You can really see how effective this strategy is against a dwarf army that is not prepared for it. Alright, get these units all over here. Let's dragon over here. See if we can charge that guy over there without uh, too much trouble. Ever ready. Death 
I think we want to charge these guys for it as well at this point. But you can see even like their Dwarf Lord, Thorgrim Grudge Bear, is taking a lot of damage here. Our General is taking a lot of damage as well. Let's use this Potion of Toughness. This Dwarf Warrior is here, standing there facing the wrong direction. Oh, looks like we're taking some shots on our Great Eagle, but that's fine. Alright. So we'll use these guys to fire at these rangers with great weapons. Ooh, I want to run away with my general here. Let's go ahead and uh, toss one of these on our dragon. Move it over towards these guys here. I think our great eagle has fled. That is true, yep. Our few glid guard, fraternal guard rather, have uh, crashed into their lines though. And despite the fact that we've only got, like, two of them, they're doing a fantastic job here. Can our Dryad take these guys out, I wonder? Lady of the deep woods. Look how much damage that uh, Dwarf Lord that was taking there. Alright, let's get this guy to charge into these Iron Drakes. Or these, uh, whatever these guys are, Dwarf Warriors. Alright, let's screw these guys over here. I don't want them moving. Don't know why they were catching up to my archers like that. Alright, so we'll fire at these rangers here. Get my eternal guard over here firing at them. Just continue firing away at whatever we can. Who's this over here? It's one of my units. See how accurate those are. Pretty accurate, actually. Alright, Thorgrim's taking some bad beatings there. Alright, where's our... ...stuff that's back here. Let's sort of move all of our sort of weakened units over to here. Get ready to uh, heal them up a bit. Looks like his uh, few units though. Oh, there goes, there goes his general. All right. We are out of ammunition on a bunch of our archers though, so that is a problem. I probably should have held fast with my eternal guard for a little bit longer there. Let's see if we can heal these guys up a bit. Great eagle back in the fight though. I think we might be able to take these guys out just with a charge from these guys, but let's get our dragon as well to head over here. Rear charge with that. So let's try and just get whatever we can, as far as units that have arrows, back up to here. What's my opponent still got here? Oh. Got an archer unit being chased away here. They're probably not going to be able to make it. Alright. So what do we want to hit here? Probably actually want to hit these guys. There, I, I would argue what's most dangerous right now. That's a decent amount of damage. Alright. And we're going to probably want to just charge in with some stuff, potentially. Actually, let's run up first. Yes. Ready to fire. Orders. Okay, this unit is done for, so we're going to move all these other ones over here. Alright, let's move out of the way with this guy. Alright, so, where's those archers? Right, let's go ahead and use Earthblood over here. 
Oops. I think I putzed that up a bit. Let's get our units back into the radius of that. I think we can heal our general as well a little bit more. Get our eternal guard over here. What's left of them, rather. Alright, so he's got quite a decent amount of ranged units left. I'm going to turn off skirmish mode, actually. Ah, no, we'll keep it on. They should be able to fire while running, but I don't think they can if the guy's behind us, so... It's just going to have to be the way it is. Um, alright. So these units uh, healed up just a tiny bit. A little bit longer before we get another one of those. Might have already capped out on healing those guys, though. No, nope, looks like I can. Not 100% sure, actually, that this works at uh, replenishing units that are, um, like, at, at healing dead units. Not 100% sure about that. I don't think it actually does. But let's find out in a second here. I think we'll just cast it now. We'll get back another one in a bit. This isn't the most expensive of spells, honestly. So that'll help. Alright, let's get back into the combat here. Charge these guys with the dragon, I think. Charge you with the great eagle. Go at a different angle with that. Um... Uh, cast one of these in the middle of all this nonsense. Why can I not cast this? Alright. So we have very little ammunition left, which is sort of a problem. Let's just target these rangers. Fire into the back of our own guy here. Let's cast this on our dragon. Not that that actually matters what we're doing here, but... Alright. Switch to melee. Switch to melee and charge into these guys. Alright. what our Branch Wraith can do. Looks like we're completely out of magic right now. Oh, our dragon is being left alone for a second here. Alright, let's get the rest of our Glade Guard in here. And, uh, yeah. No, this should be just about the end of this fight. Pretty much out of ammunition, though. Lady of the deep wood. I need a retreat with my general. If I can't, looks like I won't be able to. Alright, let's get into this cannon, I guess. See if we can take it out. dwarf unit over there. If our general rallies, then we might have a bit of a chance here, but I think we're actually in trouble. Well, it's hard to say, honestly. Oh, we've broken through. I think that's going to be um, the rest of their morale. Okay, so I think that worked out. 
So yeah, just a very annoying style of fighting, honestly. I don't necessarily think that I agree with this particular way of fighting. Um, we'll try another one that's a bit of a melee rush, how about, after this one. Yeah, my general didn't rally. So, my dwarf opponent could have won this one a lot more effectively if he had taken a lot more um, range troops instead of what he took, but... It's not really what he decides to take there, and that should be the rest of it. Alright. So, yeah, a bit of a, a cheesy style of play there. Um, we'll try and get into another one, and we'll play it differently. I think that is something that the dwarves are going to be quite weak against, though. You can see quite a lot of uh, kills caused by some of these units there, but... Glade Guard, Starfire Shafts against Dwarves, tons and tons of kills racked up by these guys. Forest Dragon got a lot of kills. Glade Lord got a lot of kills, even though I wasn't microing her. Uh, just because she's able to start firing that bow for a long time. Eternal Guard with Shields did a pretty good job, each of them. Uh, the Branch Wraith actually did a fairly good job there. Um, Sorgrim Grudge Bear just got completely owned by the Armor Piercing Arrows because he doesn't have a great missile block chance. It was, it was a weird fight. It was a really weird fight, but... Um, Let's go on and get into another one and uh, see how that goes when I play a very different style. Okay, and we're back. Uh, we're playing against the Empire. Um, there are certain things that I cut out, and we'll talk about them in uh, separate videos, but for now, like, there's certain matchups that I think are a little bit broken and probably need to be hotfixed, in particular the way that Undead are working right now. And the way that Morgur, Mor the, the new Beastman Lord, works is a little bit janky. Um, I think they're actually bugs, though. I don't think that they're intentional balance uh, decisions, except for the Undead one. The Undead one's kind of crazy, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, so I had to skip some of those because they were just not entertaining uh, battles to be in. But uh, suffice it to say... Wood Elves definitely better at the skirmishing type of gameplay. We're still going to go for a melee rush type here. Um, I think that still what people are going to do with them is almost exclusively going to just be all uh, skirmishing. And I, I think that's a bit of an annoyance. I don't like factions that sort of revolve around that sort of style of gameplay. But I guess they can isolate and destroy certain units. It's just that like um, in certain matchups it's, it, it's become pretty obvious that these guys are a little bit down-tuned in their melee department. Like, I've had War Dancers, I've been using them against um, things like, say, um, what's it called? Against, like, Skeletons with Spears. And the War Dancers, like, were having a difficulty actually getting rid of the Skeletons with Spears. Like, that's how bad they are. Um, it, it's pretty ridiculous, actually. But, and that, it wasn't even, like, a multiple-on-one fight. It was a one-on-one -on -one fight. Uh, so I do think that there are some problems um, in the way that that works right now. And also, there are tons of battles where I would have had a very easy time uh, locking down a unit using the special ability from the other type of Glade Lord, and then I would have been able to sort of pound that unit with either arrows or surround it with spears or catch up with them with my War Dancer spears. And that synergy works really well with the Wood Elves, but since you don't have that with the standard generic list, um, you sort of end up in a situation where they're sort of weak to certain things that um, makes you just really wish that uh, you were using the other type of general and you were using sort of that better um, style of build. Alright, looks like we're up against a corner camping um, Empire player here who's up on a hill. Corner camping. Good for him. Uh, what are these? Great cannons? Okay, that's fine. Unfortunately for us, we've decided to not take uh, any archers, which would have made this extremely easy. But... Such is life sometimes, say la vie. Going to stay spread out as much as possible, and we're going to go ahead and start advancing. But um, fortunately for me, my opponent can't at the very least uh, just start summoning a whole bunch of stuff. Um, since I don't see any wild wizards, they did increase the amount of stuff that wild wizards can also uh, summon, which is fine. I don't particularly mind that, but it's still a little bit annoying that they've sort of buffed that style of gameplay. All right, so our spears can get in there front to front and deal some pretty good damage to their spears as well. Uh, we are going to have a little bit of trouble getting in with our general, who's going to probably get kind of owned here. Um, but we've got some fast cav that can come around the flanks pretty effectively, I think. Let's go ahead and get these guys way, way around the flank there. Just fire some pot shots at this uh, light wizard here that's decided to run up. Uh, I really don't. All right, whatever, <laughs> whatever the hell. All 
All right, and um, I'm just going to grab up all these guys, and we're going to just charge forward here. Dealing a decent amount of damage to his um, bright wizard, with our, just with our arrows. Let's try and get into the flank here. Yeah, that's fine. The accuracy is such that I think there's a small amount of homing on the uh, arrows fired by these guys. Alright, again we've got a problem that I knew existed and still dislike is that you automatically stop running forward with these guys. Ah, I see some cavalry back there. What kind is that? Demigrifines or Calverts. Alright, so I actually do have some bonuses to attacking uh, these sorts of things, but let's go ahead and pop that there. Let's go ahead and pop this on my general pro- actually no, let's not, let's- oh well it's too late, it's already cast. Alright, so I'll use our general here to potentially charge- ah no, let's keep firing at this uh, bright wizard here. Alright, these guys managed to deal good damage real quick to those uh, hand gunners. Gonna try and get back out after that. Still getting shots on that uh, guy over there, which is nice. I do want to finish this guy up. Alright, let's do a quick heal on this side over here. Get a charge over on these guys. Alright, their wizard's finally away. Get a charge on these guys here. So this would have been much easier if I had archers, honestly, but seems to be working pretty well, honestly. Let's get a quick uh, cast of this on these guys. And you can see how effective these guys are against any Griff Knights. Like I already said, these guys are going to be very good for that particular role. Um, I think that they're going to be one of the best ones for it. Uh, oh, crap. Almost lost my general there. Got the potion of toughness off in time. It's gonna heal him up quite a bit. Ouch, ouch, ouch. I think he must have been getting hit by that witch hunter there. I think we got hit by one of those, whatever it's called. Alright, get a charge in the back of these guys here. this guy. Let's get him to charge. It's Witch Hunter. So it's kind of actually dangerous to take armor against the uh, Wood Elves, which is really weird. But that is sort of the way it is right now. Treekin walloping away at this Witch Hunter. You'd think like elite armored infantry would have an easy time, but they're actually so expensive that the numbers disadvantage and problem that the Wood Elves have sort of melts away. I definitely think my opponent would have been better off. Well, on the other hand, like the one nice thing about the handguns over the uh, archers, crossbows, is that his, um, he would have done very well if I took a tree man, but I didn't, so worked out okay. Uh, war dancers with spears. I do like the way that they perform against the uh, these demigriff knights with halberds, but my opponent could have taken a much, much better army against me. I think that the Empire is actually one of the factions that isn't really a great matchup against the Wood Elves. I wouldn't want to take the Empire against them, as, whereas, like, 
the undead, I think, right now would be extremely powerful against um, wood elves. So uh, we'll see how things turn out, though, just as things patch and progress. I think that there's going to have to be a hot patch fixing some of the spells that they've included in the game. But um, yeah, no, I think that this worked out pretty well against this opponent. Against most others, I would definitely recommend taking the archers, but uh, we'll see how things happen to be in later uh, patches. And uh, we'll see how things continue to progress as the game develops. So anyway, I hope you found this video enjoyable. And of course, as always, I hope to see you guys all next time.